Welcome to Treasure Valley Podcast. We were live during Tree Fort 10, and this is the conversation we had with some local musicians about music and songwriting and being creative in general. Enjoy the conversation. Well, welcome to Treasure Valley Podcast. Thank you all for taking your time on a Thursday afternoon to come listen to us talk about music. Um, I'm Chuck. This is my frequent co-host that's bookending the table is Elliot. And the musicians that we have that are going to be talking music are Riley of Wind, Dale of Endless Atlas, and Jesse of Jesse Blake Rundle. Jesse of himself. (laughs) That is what I am. Yeah. Um, The reason I invited these three musicians on to talk about music is... We frequently post uh, live musical recordings along with video for the podcast. And uh, these three kind of, in my mind, I imagine that the three of you are creative enough to where if we removed your instruments from you and just gave you whatever you could grab, like let's say in this room, you would still probably be able to make a song or some type of music from that. Um, If you listen to their recordings that they have on Spotify or Bandcamp and then compare them to Treasure Valley Live performances that they recorded for us, um, the songs are recognizable, but the, the creativity in being able to attack things in the studio and then present them live um, within the given limitations to me was, was pretty incredible. Like uh, I thought that you all were really great and to be able to see somebody perform music, listen to the music um, like on an album and have a different experience when you're there with the artist I think is really important and all three of you represent that uh, I think very well. So um, I, I I think, Elliot, you have a really like pretentious question Yeah, to start us all off about creativity. Can you read that out? Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote it down. Um, there's a really great uh, Charles Baxter quote. He's an author. And this actually it, it related to his writing, but he said, art is both spontaneous and arranged. And I just want to maybe just go down the line. How do you guys like feel about that as like, one as a quote, is it, is it honest? Or do you guys, and where do you guys find yourself on that spectrum if you think between those two poles in terms of spontaneity and like arrangement or those two different processes? Um, did you, should I point? Is that part of the host <laughs> stuff? I have to like point at the person well, and say you. This need is a to... recording, so nobody can see you if you're pointing at. Okay, so. you answer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we'll start with you, Riley, because you're right next to me. Okay. Yeah. Was it creativity or? Uh, no, it was basically art is both spontaneous and arranged. I feel like I relate to both. I feel like art for me comes from a place of spontaneity, and it usually just kind of unfolds in the moment. Um, and then as far as performances go, I really like performing improvisational music and hanging out in that extreme of just seeing what happens as it happens. And I also really like arranging music and putting a lot of work into the details and having everything be performed an exact way. Um, so kind of a both hand. I have a question to kind of to follow up with that because when you came into Treasure Valley Live and you performed with Ross on bass, it was just you on... Uh, your harp, Mm -hmm. and then Ross on bass, and you two just played two songs that you didn't even know what was going to happen. Yeah. And we had hit record on that, which I thought was really cool. But then when you're here in Tree Fort, a lot of times, the times that I've seen you, you have, you know, a string section, which I would imagine as you add musicians, it becomes increasingly more difficult to kind of leave into that impromptu type environment. Yeah. So how do you approach that when you're... Yeah, so far as a full band, I've, up until this show, arranged all of the string music, and so the songs, you know, you actually have to know how many times you're playing through a section and what is coming next. When Ross and I play just together, it's usually still all improvised. Um, But then as soon as we add in more than the two of us, we have everything pre-written. I'd love to someday play larger improvisational shows, but you have to really practice a lot to be able to listen to each other and be willing to sort of dive off that cliff together and know that you've got each other's back. So we're not quite, haven't quite tried that as a full band yet, but it's fun. I would imagine it would be really difficult if you don't have the time in with that group of people. Most of our favorite songs though do come from improvisations. So even as like Holotrope is one of our release songs and that entire song was an improv and most of what you hear in the recording, like the drums and the breathing is the original recording of that improv. Mm -hmm. Um, So even in our songwriting process, it's, it's pretty improvisational based and then we just are relearning the thing that came out in that moment of inspiration. That's cool. So like a music type journal and stuff. Do you guys record like while you're Sometimes, improvising? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. That time we did and I'm really grateful for it. Otherwise that song would have just disappeared <laughs> into this and never come back. Yeah. 
So what about you, Dale? Like you actually designed a software to play live. Yeah. Was some of the impetus for that to be able to like actually introduce spontaneity into some into like a type of music that might be kind of considered to be very systematic? You know, that was part of the original intent, um, but that has kind of fallen by the wayside a bit just due to the complexity of, because I, I perform solo with the software and I, I build up a lot of layers through looping. Um, so originally I had a lot of manual control with like pedals and stuff where I could like stop that loop or like start it over, undo it, like just kind of do uh, on the fly, stuff like that. Um, but I did find eventually that, because my primary format of music that I write is kind of like indie electronic pop songs, right? And um, I found that that, I was just managing too many things mentally. So I would agree with a lot of things that Riley said, like the, the genesis of songs comes from kind of an improvisational place. Usually I'm just doodling around on the piano or a guitar or something and I record it, right? And then later I'll go back and I'll kind of write additional parts. But in the moment live um, for, for like my songs at least, it tends to be more on rails at that point. And, and for similar reasons, although I don't have extra musicians just to make sure everything works together and it's gonna hit right, you know, and everything's gonna be harmonious when I want it to be. Um, there does need to be some degree of, uh, oh, the spontaneity kind of needs to go away a little bit. Um, but that also enables me to be more in the moment performing like what I'm playing and what I'm singing. Um, but sometimes, yeah, I, I, I've done improvisational stuff, which is much more free form and ambient, kind of like the story for it stuff we, we did last year, which was really fun. So it's, it's a mix of both, just depends on the point in the process you're at, I guess. Okay, cool. And then uh, what about you, Jesse? I think like writing songs is usually more spontaneous for me. Like I need to get in a really specific mood to generate stuff where I'm not really self-critical. And so that part is very spontaneous. And then the like analytical side thing gets applied. I'm like, okay, I've got this section and that section. I like have a verse idea, I think. And then I start thinking about how I want to structure the song. And that is much more arranged and analytical than like generating the song idea. And then the same thing happens in production where like in production I'll have, you know, I have like a song that I know I want to produce and I know it's supposed to be like sort of angry sounding, but I'm not totally angry. So then I start just exploring sounds, like turn on a synth, grab a few guitars, try different tones, try changing the tempo. Um, and that's, I like wish it was a little bit more analytical so I could, you know, say I'll have this done in two hours, but it's never that way. It's like, I need to explore for, an hour or three days or three months before I find the thing that I'm looking for. So it takes me a long time sometimes. And the three of you are all excellent. I kind of want to springboard on that. You're all very excellent when it comes to using various synthesizer type noises and effects and, and that type of approach to music, um, which I think that you're right, Jesse, it kind of gives that, that added emotional uh, context for something and gives you more tools in your toolbox as far as being able to, to take just maybe say one instrument and make it express itself differently. Um, do you all have examples of times that you've, you've had like some like epiphanous moment when it came to like putting together a song and finding some of those, those cruxes, some of those, uh, whether it be a sound or whether it be a riff that allowed you to move forward to the next, to the point of completion? And before answering, can you uh, say great job using the word epiphanous in a sentence? <laughs> I can cross that off my list now. <laughs> my epiphanous moment was, um, I had this song that was like very simple acoustic guitar song, just kind of alternating between a low D and a high D back and forth. And it was really fun to play. And um, I would just like sit around playing, writing it. But then I recorded it and it just sounded awful. It sounded so thin. And um, so I started just trying different things out and I found this uh, synthesizer tone that was like really beefy, fat sound with like a lot of grit in it, which is not usually something I go for. And I just like switched to using the synth to do this ba -do, ba -do sound and it opened up the whole song. It like it changed not just the production, but it changed, like I feel like I uncovered something that was in the writing of the song, like in the lyrics that I didn't know was there until I found that tone. And then the whole song structure changed and I'm, I'm still working on that song. It'll be on the next album, but um, the actual album recording is like an improv that I recorded that day for like probably recorded 20 minutes of this improv with a drum machine and the synthesizer and then took that and chopped it up into about a four minute song and that's like the recording. It's just an improv chopped up. Um, so it totally took a new shape that day. Nice. Um, yeah, so 
what I'm thinking about isn't specifically synthesizers, but it's a sampling. So it's kind of in the same ballpark because I'm playing on the keyboard. But something that I did a lot last year, which was new to me um, for a couple songs, is when I'd have maybe like, th there's this kind of like place like halfway through the songwriting process where it's easy to get kind of stuck where like you like some of the vibes that are happening and you there's moments of transition you like, but like the whole thing isn't necessarily working yet. Um, My brother has a quote for that. He's called murder your baby yeah so this is actually that but what like <laughs> kill your darlings kill your darlings oh, that's yeah. the pc pg one right yeah yeah it, just well, sounds, it sounds more emotionally like impactful if you say yeah. murder and baby though. you have that right. thing that you, that's you latch on to that's creative and you're like oh but it's hard to let go right well so what i found worked really well for me is um murdering your baby but then using the pieces so like what i would do <laughs> is <laughs> franken baby right well so what i would do is i like put it into it like just take a whole song and put it into a sampler or just like run the song on a loop and then put it through like a bunch of granular sampling effects pedals and turn knobs and then record the output of that and just kind of iterate through it in in some sort of way that maybe like almost introduces randomness to it but it keeps the fundamental sounds and it keeps some of the vibes so then it, it's like throwing it in like a blender and it comes back at you in an unexpected way and especially for me because I tend to write and record by myself um, it's almost like getting a fresh perspective like I had another musician there you know so I have songs on the on my album that I, I've been working on where really like the whole basis for this song was another song that just didn't work but then it got chopped up and garbled so much that you couldn't even tell if you listen to both of them but the, the through line is there and the pieces of the remaining pieces of that first song were the basis of the new one but, but like again you have to be willing to abandon that first one to some degree and, and just like completely change it up so that's been really useful for me that's cool so you're just basically taking ideas that you know that work and then putting them back together again, reassembling them. Right, so but often with some sort of injected randomness. Like I might put it into a sampler with random sampling points and then like throw that through an arpeggiator and just play random notes on the piano, which just scrambles it up into completely, um, you know, I'm, I have no idea what's gonna come back when I'm pushing the keys, but it's do that until it sounds cool. And I'm like, okay, that's the new basis. That's cool, like that. I like that. That's a good way to get out of like any type of writer's block mm, situation. Yeah. Awesome. Do you have anything to elaborate, Riley? I mean, yeah, there's been a few. When I first started playing, it was just the harp. And I think incorporating pedals, incorporating effects adds a lot of like areas that you can go. And then branching out from being a solo project to including Ross and adding a string quartet, um, I, I think in some ways it almost makes it like there's other musicians in the room. Like you're putting notes into the software and listening to it play back. And a few of the first songs that I wrote really, I don't even, I can't play them solo even ever at all anymore. I wrote the string parts to be so integral to them that they made the song, and so those are six-piece songs now, and if I don't have the strings there, then I just won't perform them. So I think that was a cool sh big shift that happened, was I think incorporating just more people in the band. And learning how to allow that sound to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose Ooh. trusting people too, to be able to play yeah, your idea correctly. Like, I don't even <laughs> have to play that much. I can just kind of sit back and like, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Everybody else, the hard parts. Um, yeah. But yeah, I get that. That's what I'm doing on this podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting back, coming up with some random comments every once in a while. Yeah. yeah, I've definitely had that happen to Riley, where like I started with the song and I even played it live for a while, and then it changed with a recording or with a band. And now I've, if I've, every time I try to play it, I realize why it never worked mm -hmm. before, why the audience is like, oh, that's cool, but play another one, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, And they just change as you develop them with the band. It's really fun. It's super fun, yeah. Yeah, we're, I'm in that boat now that we've added the strings players for this current set. We've started incorporating a lot more three-part harmonies, and I'm just like, hey, guys, if we play as a four-piece, I think we just need a different set because I can't play these songs just by myself anymore. <laughs> like, yeah. Every new layer you add the, just makes the songs come alive more, and then it's that much harder to try to go back to like a different iteration of them. Have any of you ever had an experience where you were able to take something complicated and then simplify it, and then get something more interesting out of that? Just throwing. I was working on that there, right like before this podcast today. Oh, okay. Because I have my this band is not set. staged. <laughs> <laughs> I have my band set on Sunday, but then a solo or duo set on Saturday, and. I'm trying to figure out how to take a few songs that are band songs and then change them up so I can play them on acoustic or electric guitar solo. And I'm finding like, I gotta change the tempo. I sometimes have to change the time signature for it to really work so that the energy, 
Because like the main thing I think about with live performance is like having a solid through line of energy, like some kind of groove and that the audience can follow it. And that when you're playing a band and you're playing like a fast tempo and then you try to do that solo, you just can't carry that energy on the guitar. So I have to slow them down a lot. And so I'm still working on that for the Saturday set. I'm sure you'll figure it out by then. I'll figure it out. <laughs> like, what, 48 hours? <laughs> you got it. Um, so you all are very uh, great songwriters, I think. And one of the things that people underestimate, I think, with musicians is the time in. There's that, like, the, the, the natural talent thing that I think people that ingest music more passively um, or don't ever experiment with writing their own music or playing an instrument, they kind of just adhere everything to, not everything, but give a lot of credit to natural talent. But I imagine that the three of you have 10,000 hours in, like what Malcolm Gladwell says, like 10,000 hours of mastery, not only in, in an instrument or several instruments, but also a lot of those hours into the song writing aspect. Um, I would just about imagine for all of you. Is there, is there any like uh, milestone lessons that you learned throughout that process of you know, learning your instrument um, and then transitioning because at least for me as like a novice guitar player, like you, you cover other people's songs, you get good, and then you have to relearn that whole thing again while you're trying to make your own music because then you're taking, you're trying to create your own ideas in your head and that's another process. Mm -hmm. So do any of you have milestones that you want to share about, you know, learning an instrument or learning how to create music? Um, yeah, something that comes to mind for me, um, like you said, I've been doing this for a long time and I've played a bunch of different instruments, is, is the songwriting thing um, is a whole beast in and of itself that you have to like put in your, whatever, your 10,000 hours or whatever for that. Like, Because I was originally a guitar player for many years and I got to a point where I was in bands and I was like writing cool guitar parts, um, but like everybody in the band was just doing cool stuff on their instrument and nobody was necessarily writing a cohesive good song right so like in that situation we had musicians that would come to our shows and be like that that riff was sick but like we wouldn't get you know, you know general audience being like oh that's a good song um so just realizing that and taking a step back and be like well like can you take this song and just strip away all the arpeggiators or guitar riffs and just like can you just sit down and play this on an acoustic guitar and sing the melody and is it still cool like realizing that you kind of have to have that basis a lot of times to build it up from uh, was a big deal for me and then spending time focusing on that and and, and intentionally avoiding my natural inclination to just like go start doing some cool guitar stuff. Be like, well, no, don't do that until you have that foundation laid and there's something to build it off of that actually will support it all. You know, that was a big deal for me. That's a good point because I feel like, you know, if you take a famous song that maybe has a lot of parts, um, but if it's a good tune, like a lot of Beatles stuff comes to mind, you can just strum an acoustic guitar and sing the melody. And it's like, oh, there it is. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Anyone else want to share about that experience? I think I had to really learn to adopt a beginner's mindset on a really, really deep level. So some of the things that I do the most of now, like singing, I never thought I could be a singer. I never thought that I could write lyrics. I never thought that I could even really write music. And so transitioning from playing music in other people's bands and recognizing that I was good at mimicry for a while when I was younger, I was like, I'm good at learning other people's songs. My hands seem to be good at picking up a new skill but I'm not good at being an artist. I could never be an artist and create. And so learning to apply the mentality of like, just because something's hard for you and you don't know how to do it, doesn't mean you can't learn how to do it to everything, even the emotional aspect of writing music um, is what has allowed me to open up the door to writing lyrics and singing on stage and like composing string parts. I think it actually helped that I started my band through harp, which was a new instrument. Um, I played my first solo show, I think, nine months after I got my first harp, so I was quite quite a beginner at it still. Oh, wow. Uh, and I think being a beginner at the harp helped me with the emotional process of being a beginner at exercising my creativity in a healthy way. Right on. That's impressive. Jesse, do you have anything to add on that? We're looking for like a really good aphorism, like a rule really to good live one. by. Something really pithy. Um. One sentence. <laughs> if you want to be really good at do this, rule one. I, I don't know if I have a good one. I think I resonate with what you both have said here. I I didn't expect to be a singer. I I really liked playing guitar and writing instrumental music, and but in order to play music live, you have to start singing. So I started doing that, and it was 
weird to me that people would compliment my singing and not my guitar playing. Um, <laughs> and I was kind of offended. <laughs> do you think there was? Do you think there might have been some confusion there too? I mean, no, not to, not to say anything against, but like if you are focused on your guitar playing and you're executing something good, I, sometimes I feel like people naturally just are inclined to grab onto whatever the lyrics are being said or what's being presented vocally. Like if you're a lay yeah. person when it comes to music. No, you're probably right. Most people don't notice what you're doing on the guitar, especially if you're not moving Unless your it's in hands the way. fast. Yeah. Like if you're doing a lot of this, then people think you're good. If you're doing other things, they don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I had to kind of switch. And as I've moved more to, towards doing band shows instead of solo shows, I've simplified guitar parts significantly so that I can focus on singing and kind of leading the band and creating the groove rather than trying to do something too complicated to even allow me to focus on singing. So. Nice. I dig it. Um, so what are some times that you've, you've uh, kind of gone down into a cul-de-sac, like a creative cul-de-sac? Do, do any of you have stories of when you were trying to do something, and so often we have an, an image in our head, like if we go A, B, C, D, it's going to end up like in this specific realm. And then you spend a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of effort, and it all falls apart. <laughs> it's a loaded question. I know. <laughs> I mean, I think probably we all do, but I don't know if I have specific examples, but... Um, so like of the number of songs that I've actually produced to completion and I play live and I have recordings of, there's at least twice as many that are like that, you know? And I think being willing to either abandon stuff or chop it up like I was saying before, but sometimes you just have to abandon it and be like, that seemed like a good idea at a time, but be willing to start fresh if you get too stuck. Um, yeah, um, just don't get too fixated on anything. Be willing to start start from scratch if you have to. So, so that's, not, that's not murdering your babies, it's abandoning your babies. Right, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I hit a cul-de-sac early on in recording where I had some songs I liked and I decided I didn't want to become good at recording and producing, so I hired someone to do it. And he's a really talented guy. I think he's actually playing here at Tree Fort. Um, and we recorded a song together and I, I really loved it. I thought it was so cool. And then about three months later, I was like, oh, I don't like this. Not because it's bad, but because it doesn't like fit the mood that I'm aiming for because I had no idea what I was even aiming for. I didn't know what the options were. So that led me down a path of like getting some gear and starting to learn how to record and thinking a lot about arrangement and production um, and trying to own that because I felt like it was critical for me in expressing the songs I was writing and that I couldn't like offload that to somebody else. Hmm. That makes sense. Do you have anything to add to that, Riley? Um, just a little bit of the same that they both said. Uh, hundreds of half-written songs that, you know, in the moment you're like, oh my gosh, this could go somewhere. And, and in the end, maybe that song wasn't meant to exist, but that, you know, anywhere from 10 minutes to three hours that I spent pursuing a creative idea without judgment, that was the important part, you know, that teaches me that I am capable of doing that and it teaches my ideas that I'm a safe space for them to come to. Nice. Um, so it, it doesn't really matter to me that they're dead ends because I feel like the effort was still the important part. It all adds up to that 10,000 yeah. hours of practice. And you kind of touched again. I wanted to talk to you guys about... Uh, also, the 10,000 hours thing, I think, has been disproven for the most part. Just so you know. <laughs> what is it? Like? It's 10,462. Is Malcolm Gladwell a scientist? <laughs> Uh, so, so I do want to talk about like the Malcolm Gladwell got in a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> There's certain things you can learn in five thousand hours. There's certain things that needs like twenty thousand. We should talk about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's cover that. We're switching gears. Um, so uh, about recording and, and performing, and you kind of touched on a little bit there, uh, Jesse. And I think that it's really cool. I, uh, Riley, I don't know. Do you do a lot of the the recording and production on your end for wind? Ross handles almost all of it. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. So you guys basically are working together closely to get that done, and you two are working basically on your own for most of your recordings. Um, but you all perform live, too, which you're, like I pointed out earlier, your recordings stand alone and your live performances stand alone. And, Jesse, obviously you take into account, like, what are the people and instruments you're going to have on stage and how do I translate this song into something that's better for live performances. Do you, you all want to share some experiences on how recording 
is so much different from live performance and, and maybe some mistakes that you've made along the way trying to translate one into the other or some lessons that you learned? I see you smiling, Riley. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're working on an EP right now, and something that I'm learning is that we need to record our songs as we're writing them because I get bored of the things that I've written oh so quickly. So we're working on recording songs that I wrote before the pandemic, and then the pandemic hit. And in that time, Ross has picked up and gotten very, very good at audio engineering. So we're working on recording all these songs together. And I'm just like, I'm over it. They're boring. They're not good. So it's hard to have like the energy for them. Um, the way that I think I prefer to record is when something is still fresh, because you can almost do composition through the recording process. Uh, that's the way Holotrope came out. We worked okay. on that recording three weeks, I think, after the initial improv, and then we had a two-week deadline to like add layers to it, to write lyrics, to make it a little bit more song-like, to say, here's our structure. What can we add to this to make it feel real um and that was a blast uh so it's been it's been interesting just learning how to record and how i work well within a recording process and how different it is from live because live is just com you know either memorized music or Im improvised music does the audience help in that situation to where you if you are playing a song again for the umpteenth time when you're live that it doesn't like get as boring for you? Yeah, audience energy is so much. Sometimes I almost wish I could record to an audience. I, I have a hard time recording improv because the audience changes so much of how I improvise. So I've gone in to try to record like a duo improvised set and it worked pretty okay with you, but sometimes it's a bit of a flop because without anyone there listening, I don't have any like feedback, like there's so much feedback the audience gives you that you play with and it helps me focus on an idea and it helps me sort of walk that tightrope of being in the present moment and not slipping off into like songwriting mode or judgment mode. You're just like in that present moment seeing, seeing it unfurl as you're going. That's so much easier with an audience and you go so many more interesting places with an audience. So sometimes I kind of wish a whole audience could just be in the studio with me, I think that would be quite helpful. Do you think part of that is just like actually adding stakes to like the performance too? Because yeah. like when you're performing for somebody, then like there is like kind of this thing yeah, in the back of your head, like, oh, if it falls apart, they're gonna hate it. I'm storytelling like, now yeah. and I can't just stop and start again. I need to stick to this story and I uh, there's a bit more commitment there. There's like this, it's like accountability almost because yeah. you can't just stop and try again. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else what, care to share? What were we talking? We were talking about recording to Re live kind recording, of translation? yeah, live performances and okay, lessons yeah. that lessons that you've learned um, on one versus the versus the other, and how right. they aren't necessarily the same. Yeah, they're definitely not the same for me because, like, when I'm recording, I have the freedom to do whatever I want and layer as many things as I want. You know, different synthesizers, or guitars, or whatever. And then when I'm playing live, I'm trying to execute the spirit of the same thing, but in such a way that I don't have to spend like five minutes before the song starts just recording parts, right? Mm -hmm. um, so often that means I have to either like combine parts and find a way like, well, I can play this melody and harmony at the same time, but then I maybe have to find a different guitar tone or a different synthesizer that sounds good if you play them together. Or sometimes I just have to, uh, this was a big thing, um, realize that like I'm not going to replicate exactly what was on the record, but I, I need to rep replicate the spirit and the feel of it. Sometimes that means actually a different part. Um, yeah. But as long as you can still get the, the feeling of the song across, um, that's fine. And, and going down the road of like being like, well, how am I going to make it sound exactly like the record is actually a dead and is not going to sound good you know, just because it, it feels different. And then like I said, the, the execution for me is like if I had a band full of people that all had the same gear, maybe I could just do the exact same thing. Um, but just due to the logistics of what I'm doing, that often doesn't work out. So, yeah. Makes sense. And the, the recording, it's so much easier to make the song sound full. I think you had mentioned that, someone had mentioned that earlier, just because you can right. keep layering, 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 and then you have your limitations when you're in a live performance. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we gotta, I gotta scrap. And uh, people Unless that just have, play a tape, just yeah. the other parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're David Byrne, that's hard to get away with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But, that, uh, but when you have a, I would imagine when you guys record uh, your albums, you're probably dealing in like minimum like 20, 30 ish tracks, I would just about guess. Yeah, right around there. And so if you think about that, like replicating that with, with human beings. And then when I mixed your uh, live performance day, I was kind of impressed because you were hitting a lot of, of those instruments just on your live 
with your software. So, so Dale has a program that he loops with that he wrote himself because he's a computer programmer. Um, and so you were able to hit some of those those cues with those instruments really quickly and then trigger, it, trigger them again to the point you did have, I think, like 12 or 13 or yeah, yeah. And <laughs> 15 I play, that's, tracks. That's one of the reasons I wrote the software, because I can play tricks to get away with stuff, because I, like I said, I don't want to delay. So sometimes I'll do stuff like I'll actually write a part, or if I have a long part I have to do, I might do something like play it at twice the speed so I can do it faster and then like put an octave up. But then in the software, I'll slow it down, almost like you're playing the tape at half speed so that I can get it done quicker. But then I have to like figure out a tone that sounds good when it goes through that process. And, and just a bunch of stuff like that behind the scenes makes it complicated. <laughs> we were even recording and then uh, my brother was looking at your hands like, you, I wasn't hearing the music that you were playing. You're like, no, I'm actually playing the next part. Yeah. yeah, and I'm recording and it, that. That so actually that messed up my editing too, because I had all these like close-up <laughs> shots of you playing piano, and then there'd just be no piano you'd be hearing. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I do that because like if I have like a chorus that has like three new parts that are going to come in, I can't play three parts at once. So if I have like maybe a sparser verse before that, I'll loop a, a section of the verse, and then while that's still going, I'll start building up the chorus parts, but mute it so nobody can hear it. But then when the chorus hits, it's like bam, it's like there's a full band there. I just like got it ready beforehand. So if you would have been born 40 years ago, you would have been able to like march around with like a drum set on you. Cymbals <laughs> yeah, in no, your knees and stuff. Yeah, there, there's some similarity there. <laughs> you, got some, you got some dexterity when it comes to multitasking with music. Yeah, yeah. So that, was a, that was a process to learn how to do all that for sure. <laughs> uh, Jesse, do you have anything to, to add on that realm? Because when you came into uh, Treasure Valley Live, I thought one of the, the cool things that you did um, you had a, you had the just you and Nate. It was a two piece setup, yeah. um, and your songs are are very full that you release um, online. And you you brought a you brought it like a an amp in and that you were running like a was it like a little, Korg the eight hundred eight yeah it was a, yeah. it was a you were running that through this it was like a cheap little guitar amp I think or was yeah. it cheaper. It was cheap, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it sounded it sounded really cool, and I just imagine that you had to go through a lot of different trials and errors to be like, okay, this is what we're going to do to get this sound that we need. And obviously, that's not present at all in right. your in your your tune that you released uh, online or on your album. But. Yeah, that was just like a late night revelation one time because I I was preparing this duo set with Nate, and Nate's a excellent partner and he like comes up with great parts that kind of fill in the gaps that the recordings would do but he does them in a different way that's unique to him um, but we needed some rhythm to just hold some of the structures together so tried a bunch of drum machines and sounds and techniques and found that, that it basically worked um, and but I'm really excited this year we have a, a real drummer so there's no I was just like pushing too many buttons and thinking too much about you know which pedals to hit and which like samples to play at different times and it was I was not as coordinated as Dale so it was very stressful for me <laughs> um, so it's it's really nice to have a live drummer now to do that instead take some shoulders the burden yeah and at, well live drums like it's it's hard to beat live drums <laughs> it's yeah it's just totally I don't care game. how cool your drum machine sounds or how cheap the amp is that it's running through. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's hard to replace a person. Oh man, uh, I, we got uh, we got about seven minutes. Oh left. dang, okay. I, that I was... wanted to uh, I wanted to do my provocative questions. Oh okay, go oh, ahead. Cool. Yeah. Please. All right, right here I go. Um, so basically, I have it written down. I'm going to read it because I'm not feeling very articulate this morning, this afternoon. Excuse me. Uh, what are your opinions on the future of music? Will streaming eventually become more progressive in its payment methods? Is there a way to make recorded content valuable again? Or will the future more and more center on live performance in terms of generating income for musicians? And the panel goes silent. This is too hard. That's a doozy, <laughs> yeah. Um. Here's, here's something I could phrase too, because my brother and I release uh, independent films, and how do you keep uh, the motivation when you're you're kicking stuff up and you don't necessarily get the the monetary reward, like what do you do to to not take that into account so much? Like what what vision do you have to be able to do this as a career path? Well, I I don't know. Like I I know there's a lot of problems with streaming and they should pay artists more, but I will say like if you've been doing this for a while and you were trying to like sell CDs anywhere other than your immediate area in your shows like 10 or 20 years ago, that was next to impossible. Like getting a distribution deal was hard. And um, then you'd have to like worry about like physically producing all of that media and getting it out to other locations. And somehow people in other cities would have to know that it was there. 
Um, so even though like the pay isn't great, um, really the barrier for entry is so much lower that I feel like there's also just way more opportunity at the beginner and like mid level. Uh, yeah, maybe it's harder to like really uh, build it into like a full time career, um, but there's there's more more of a chance for people to get started. So I don't necessarily view streaming as as that and and kind of the devaluation of the physical media as such a bad thing as everybody else does. Yeah, it makes it maybe harder to sell albums and shows and stuff, but it makes it easier for you to get out there, have a very wide reach, and maybe find your audience in a way you wouldn't have been able to before all this stuff has. So yeah, I don't think it's necessarily that bad. Oh, okay. Well. Yeah, looking at creating through the lens of needing money, I don't know whether or not to be optimistic about that. I think that for me, I, I feel better if I'm creating purely for myself and for the art to find the people that it resonates the most with. And so therefore it doesn't really matter. Um, and hopefully I can make enough money doing it. But for now I make sure that I have enough side gigs or enough reliable income that's not the creativity aspect of things so that one not doing well doesn't suck the other one down with it. And so then in regards to the future of music with technology, I'm just really excited about it because of how much lower the barrier of entry is now. People who maybe don't have time to learn an instrument don't even need to because there are apps and plugins that will make chord progressions for you. And that like people have ideas and that there's technology that will allow them to take those ideas and put them into this really cool finished piece of work without them needing the insane amount of hours and like the privilege and the access to lessons that it takes to be really like I, that's exciting to me like how many more people are going to be able to create really cool music because of all of these tools that exist and all of the technology that exists and how easy it is to just put it on the internet and then you know someone halfway around the world sees it because they were just scrolling through TikTok at like the right time or even even getting proficient on an instrument because you can watch a YouTube tutorial. Plus, and Plus, you can get find. more proficient at instruments. So it's both yeah. ways. It's easier to learn instruments now, and it's also easier to make really cool ideas without needing to learn an instrument because you you know there's so such good software that you don't need to learn to play the cello yourself anymore. You can still write cello parts. And everybody can record at home. And you know, everybody can record at home. And yeah. so you can find a cellist who's maybe halfway across the world. And if you have the same vibe, you can start working together. It doesn't matter where you physically are, which was yeah. totally not the case before. On the creative inspiration side, I'm very, very excited about it. On the, like, the, um, oh, what's the word for when there's just so much around? Uh, saturation. Saturation. Like, it creates a lot of saturation. And so when it comes to how will I then make money, mm -mm. Yeah, but I guess it was always hard to make money in the creative field anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, well, and, and you're like streaming stuff. It has a lot of peripheral benefits. Like it, it doesn't necessarily like give you direct dollars, but it can get more people to your shows because people can stream before they even see you. Whereas before, like you know, people wouldn't buy your album if they hadn't heard of you somehow, heard you on the radio, or seen you play. And if you do other things, like if you do the production thing. Like, I mean, I've gotten pretty good jobs recording or mixing other bands because they heard my stuff. And, you know, that it's not like I got a ton of streams from that, but it did open other doors for me, too. Yeah, I suppose just being open to a lot of different avenues. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think I've had to just, like Riley said, just accept that I'm probably not going to make any money at it. And so then I have to decide if I'm pursuing a project or a song, like, would I do this if there was no money? Like, and you, and then I do those things. And like my dream, I think for music is that it would be more social. Which, you know, I'm no, I'm not an anthropologist, but I assume music started socially. Mm -hmm. And I feel like everyone recording their own songs in their own bedroom, you know, fully producing their own songs, it feels really isolating. And I want music to be more social, even if we're all doing that in our own bedrooms, like at least sharing them with each other and just enjoying that creative process rather than like trying to grab at some pie that we can't get, you know? Like we don't need a slice of the pie, we just need to share with each other. I think it's way better. Well, well crap. I was really hoping that this panel would like descend into pessimism, but instead. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> optimism just so wins. optimistic. <laughs> I'll ask you guys the same question Sunday morning. <laughs> We'll all be tired of electric guitars <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> on Sunday morning. <laughs> Just be like, no, it's all going to hell. <laughs> Kids these days. All right. I think um, we're at time, aren't we? Yeah, we're out of we're out of time. One last one last quick question. Um, band you're most excited to see, or a couple of them that you can throw out that we need to see. Yeah, when are you all playing? Now? Oh yeah, first. when are you playing first? Uh, we play Sunday at six forty at Sonic Temple Blue. Okay. Uh, Saturday at seven thirty at Space Bar. Okay. 
Sunday at 4.30 at Fort Builder. Cool. Any, any, any other bands that we definitely need to check out that maybe haven't gotten? Methods Body. Methods Body. Oh, that is going to be good. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So Six, you know. 6.20 tonight. Mm-hmm. Sorry, what was that? It's Six. at six twenty tonight. Oh, okay, six twenty. Right, sweet. Another unanimous decision there. All right. Awesome. I think on that note, we should probably wrap it up. <laughs> All right, sweet. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for coming. We appreciate Happy it. Happy Freeport, Thank you. everybody. Thank you for listening to Treasure Valley Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell someone about it because they might enjoy it too. Shoot. <laughs>